Right, you're so, right, you're so welcome to the next lecture where we're going to be talking about lighting of the workspace and how much lighting we should be giving to your patients, how to, to set up. Um, um, how to set up a really well illuminated um, space for your patient or your clients, which is important as a vision scientist and uh, also as a clinician as well, because let's revisit case study one from Jordan Smith, who's an entrepreneur who used to work for a big company, but he said he had enough. He moved, he started his own company and he's running, he running it from his, um, from his home. And he started getting eye strains. And we did all, an optometrist did a whole heap of tests. The prescription's fine, the glasses is fine. He doesn't need any other kind of type of lenses. He doesn't have any eye disease. So what, what next? How could we still help him? Why is he still getting eye strains? Well, it turns out through careful uh, interview, well, with careful history taking, that this, well, it might, it's most likely due to his, his environment. In his previous work, he worked in a really well-lit environment. That's really well set up, but then because he's running his business from home, well, he had to make do with what, we, what he had. And what he had in his Californian bungalow house was an old sunroom which was surrounded by windows, windows everywhere, so lots of afternoon and morning sun coming in, causing glares, excessive light, and at night time, well, he didn't get enough light because the light fittings were about 100 years old. So that could be his problem, and as an optometrist, you sometimes have to think about the environment your patient is working in. Uh, and also, this problem becomes even more complicated if Jordan is dealing with colors. If he's just bl dealing with you know, black, or black and white prints or stuff where precise color matching isn't too important, you could probably skip this step, but if he's dealing with any precise judgment of colors or color matching, you also have to think about. Uh, this, this, this makes your, um, this adds an extra layer of complexity because as we discussed, right, it's, if you were to, I mean, if you were, I mean, the reason why they ask you to use CIE Illuminant D or D65 or C is if you look up where the D65 or C is on your color, on your color diagram, it's here, right? Right in the middle of this oval here, which is where all of these colors should be located on the color diagram. And so, and it's designed to be used for a CIE Illuminant C or D65. But if you were to use a CIE Illuminant A, a yeah, tungsten filament lamp, which Jordan might be doing, well, that's going to distort your perception of color. So that adds another layer of complexity if Jordan, Jordan startup also deal with matching colors precisely. So the thing is, right, so we established that the reason why Jordan's getting eye strain is because of the quality of the light, but also we have to recommend it. It's easy to say, well, get, just get better lighting. But the question, real question is how? How do you, um, how, uh, um, how does Jordan do this? How do you, what kind of advice should you be giving Jordan for this? Only if there was some kind of guideline. But there you go, let me introduce you to ASNZS 1680 series, which talks about lighting in the environment. It talks about useful stuff, like the amount of illuminance you need, uh, the, the, the color temperature you should be using, color rendering index, but, but but it's all they give it for different type of task as well because some tasks require more or less lighting than others, and of course if it involves colors, then they are additional consideration in terms of color rendering index and correlated color temperature. As, uh, you know, these are some of the stuff you have to think about. So we already covered color of the light, color, uh, correlated, uh, correlated color temperature and the color rendering index. But we still haven't talked about how much lighting do we need, how do we deal with glare, and how about getting a uniformly lit surface? How do you set this up? So the first question is how much, do you, how much light do you need shining onto your desk? Well, because well, if, if you ever try reading a book in the middle of the night, in the dark, well, it's not gonna work. You need a bit of light to help you out. You need more light. But the how much is too much? I mean, the thing is, right, if you have too much light, it might cause glare, uh, but, um, it might cause glare, discomfort, um, and you also might use too, have too much energy. I thought, so you don't want to go over too much, right? You don't want to use 10,000 lux for everything. There is a, so, so you need enough, but 
need, there's no need to use too much. And the thing is, why, well, how much light do you need? Well, it depends upon your task. Because are you, because you know, if you're dealing with, say, a jeweler, for instance, who's doing really fine work, if you're doing any kind of fine work, you tend to need a better illumination, a better quality illumination is needed, needed as opposed to just a casual relaxing, uh, 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 casual relaxing evening where you're just reading a magazine, that you don't need as much um, illumination. So it depends on your task. So uh, what is the relationship between you know, um, the um, quality of the lighting and how much lux, how much illumination there is? And you get this curve here. And what you will see is that, okay, well, well, well what you will see is, well, if your task is fairly, is fairly rough, that, like just reading a magazine, then you probably only need about 200 or so, the 200 so lux, you don't need too much of it. But if you're dealing with really difficult tasks, you probably need 600 or even 700 lux. If you go over a little bit, it's okay. But if you go over a little bit, it's okay. No, no harm is done here. But what you want to do is, well, don't, well, you know, you don't want to give 1,000 lux or more to everyone because you see there is very little increase in performance beyond that point. point. That the, the benefit you get from providing 1,000 lux of illumination versus 700 or is negligible. So it's really not really, it's not really worth making things too bright. And in a lot of cases, the brightest you need is about 700 or so. <coughs> so how do you get 700 lux? Well, here's, it, well, well, here's, a, here's, a, here's an example that you could do. Uh, well, let's say, well, okay, so for this desk, you need 700 lux. There's a ceiling light here, which is 2.8 meter above the floor, and the desk is 80 centimeter above the floor. Now, um, and the, the patient is asking, okay, well, what kind, how strong a light bulb do we need to put it in there? How do you calculate that? How many lumens do you need? Uh, how would you work this out? Of course, well, let's go back to all reliable, which is your inverse square law, which of course is useful in radiometry, but equally useful in photometry as well. In this case, well, you know, it's easy to solve. You have 700 lux is, the, is what you need on the table. That's how much illumination we need. So we need to find out, well, how much, well, okay, going back to the inverse square law, we need um, an intensity, which we don't know. We actually want to work it out for flux though, but flux can be worked out for intensity, assuming it's a point source, so that's not really a problem. We just have to find intensity. All right, well, where do we find all the other information? Okay, well, how about distance? Well, the lamp is 2.8 meter above the floor, and the table surface is, so 2.8 meter above the floor is the light, and 80, meet, 80 centimeter above the floor is the, the, the desk. So the distance is two meters, simple. And there we go, and how about theta? Well, we're gonna assume the light is directly above the task, and therefore theta is zero. Remember, theta is measured from your normal imaginary 90 degree axis that's emerging from your surface, in which case the, the table. If the light is directly above the table, here the theta is equal to zero. So remember, you, so remember to measure it from the normal. You plug that into the formula and you should get this. Uh, to 2800 candelas, which is in intensity. But we want, how much, we want to work out how much lumen we need, assuming the point source. So you get so um, four, well, four pi star radian to a complete sphere, assuming it's a, it's a point source, multiplied by 2800 by four pi, 35,000 lumens or so is the flux we need. Well, great. Well, is that a lot? Is that, too, is that not much? That, let's put it into perspective. An uh, average 12 watt light bulb only emits uh, 1,250 lumens. So it's not, not quite colored. That's okay, let's just get the biggest light bulb we can, which is like this fluorescent light tube. Let's get two of them. One produces 2,400, two of them together produces 4,800 lumens. Oh wait, we're not gonna have enough lumens. Hmm. The thing is that, like, you know, uh, well, there isn't any light bulb on the market that's gonna produce enough lumens. It's, even if it does, it's gonna be absolutely enormous, so you're gonna need a huge number of light bulbs, which isn't very practical. 
So what do we do? We, do, we just turn around and say, no, nope, you can't have 700 lakhs, I'm very sorry. Well, how about we work with what we have? All right, well, what do we have? A 12, well, a 12 watt light bulb that produces 1,250 lumens. How can we get 700 lux with only 1,250 lumens? Hmm. How do we do this? Intensity is 95 candles, so it's uh, about as intense as 95 candles, or 95 times more intense than candle, which is respectable, but how do we get 700 lux with it? Oh, well, let's look up the formula. Okay, we, the, we can't do anything about the intensity. That's fixed on 95. Cos the theta, no, no point changing it. Oh, but we can change the distance. So how about we do that? So, what, so how close does the light bulb need to be from the, work, the table to get 700 lux? And let's work it out. So you, put, you plug, the, plug the numbers in and you get, end up with about 40 centimeters. Mm, but well, you think, well, the ceiling isn't that low, so uh, 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 you don't really want to crouch under 40 centimeters, do you? So it's not going to work? It actually does work, right? That's why you have desk lamps. So all you have to do is get one of these light bulbs, put it into a desk lamp, put it onto the table. There you go, you got 700 lux. And this is, uh, so, uh, this is, uh, so uh, uh, this is actually discussed within the standards. Whenever you, uh, whenever, you know, the standard specifies really high amount of illumination, they say, well, you should be using task light, like desk lamps, for instance. And it's for this reason. Otherwise, if you wanted to get 700 lux through ceiling lights, environmental light, you are going to need a lot of light bulb. Which it doesn't make sense because you only need 700 lux in front of you. You don't need it for the whole room. You just imagine how much, it's, how much your electricity bill is going to cost. It just doesn't make any sense. So uh, that's an important lesson for inverse square law. You know, there are a lot of ways you can get more illumination. For example, you can change the intensity, but sometimes it's more practical to change the distance. In this case, instead of just putting more light bulbs above you, just get a desk lamp. As if it's a single light bulb, well, that will solve your problem. And that is indeed discussed within the standard. So think about it from this perspective as well, when you're so trying to solve these kind of problems. I also, yes, this is why this doesn't work. With Emily, the parents are concerned that you know, she's going to go get short-sighted. They read that, well, if you blast her two hours a day with 1,000 lux, that reduces her likelihood of becoming myopic. But, they, it's gonna, but we already saw that it's very difficult to get 700 lux with, em, with environmental lighting. So what that basically means is that well, Emily should be spending um, about two hours a day outside because you easily get 1,000 lux outside. That's basically what it means. Oh yes, and the internet is a horrifying place. That's why you always should be checking your sources. This source is saying that you should be having about 700, 600 to 1,000 lux of illumination everywhere in your house except the corridor. Oh my goodness. Um, how much is that going to cost you in terms of e electricity and light bulbs? Oh my god, how do I unsee that? So always seek a reputable source that you can't get a lot more reputable than things like AS and ZS. So make sure you look at it. Uh, anything above 600 lux is reserved for fine details. And yes, as we discussed, where is it? Here we go. Uh, the rec so required illuminance should be provided by local lighting for anything that is a lot. Like say about 600, 600 or so, you should be using a task light. So it makes sense. Great, so if you want more light, well, first, first things first, you could you know, increase the, make sure you have enough environmental lighting, but if you need something like 400, 600, no, 600, 700 lux, think about a desk lamp or something like that. But how about glare? How do we control for glare? Because that's another thing that can cause eye strain for people like Jordan Smith. Uh, well, for glares, there's a few different types, actually. Here's the disability glare. That's the one you get when you're driving it um, um, at the end of the day. The sun's really low to the horizon and the, shine, the sun is shining straight into your eyes. It's difficult for you to see the road. This is your dis disability glare. A discomfort, for, discomfort glare well, is someone, when someone high beams you from the back or from the side. I, it's uncomfortable. 
or you're sitting, or you know, you you're sitting in front of your, your window, you're trying to look at your your iPhone, and the window's too bright. It's kind of difficult to see. That that kind of glare is discomfort glare. Now um, there are ways of quantifying discomfort glare, which we won't do because it's really quite difficult to defy. It's very so we're not going to do it. Uh, but instead, what we're going to focus on is luminance and illuminance, or uniformity of luminance and illuminance, because that, those are easy to modify. So these two examples are poor example of poor illuminance here and poor luminance here. And what I mean by that is, is if you were to try to read, say, a map, no, it's the floor, so let's say you're trying to read a map, a really big map format, it's going to be quite uncomfortable with a big fat shadow cover it, going through it and covering half the map. That's not a very good illumination. This is not a very good luminance. This is very uneven. You want to look at the computer screen, but the window behind it is so much brighter compared to the screen. It's not, it's not uniform, and that's going to cause a lot of eye strain. So you, so one of the things you can do is for, um, for your client is to try to make a uniform illuminance and luminance in their workspace. So yes, so this is the problem um, Jordan uh, case study one Jordan Smith is having. He went from a welded, a nice modern welded office to something like this. And that's the problem. The illumination is not constant. It's not, it's not very well controlled, the luminance is not uniform. That's the problem with it, and we have to think about how we can... Firstly, we have to quantify the uniformity of it, and then we can think about how we could improve it for him. So, how can we measure the uniformity of illuminance? It's actually very simple. All you do is get the minimum illuminance and divide it by the average illuminance. So what you can do is you can measure the illuminance over the desk, Average that and get the smallest number from that and divide that by the average. That is your uniform the illuminance. And what does the number mean? Well, in the ideal scenario, we want the surface to be perfectly illuminated. You want, say, 400 lux everywhere on your desk. 400 lux exactly for every point of your desk that is going to be the ideal illuminance. And that is going to be a very pleasant um, illumination. Uh, but the thing is, right, we don't live in a perfect world, so, world, so we does allow for some non-uniformity. How much non-uniformity is allowed? Well, for a task, well, the uniformity should be 70% or 0.7. If, or if, it's not, if, it's not for a task, if it's not a workspace, let's say it's a corridor, 50% is fine. And we will try measuring this in the lab, in real life. Here's an example here. So with our office worker, this is in the afternoon, the sun is, is shining straight through the window, it's really good, it's very, it appears to be very well illuminated. But how about uniformity illuminance? The illum illumination is great, 1800 lux, that's, um, that's, that, that's, that, that's, you know, that's a, maybe a little bit excessive, but it's not going to cause any problem, it's like, you know, go, it's like you shouldn't cause too much of a problem, uh, because that's roughly how much lighting you get on a cloudy day. Not, not going to be a problem, but how about the minimum illumination, which you might get here, where the screen is casting a shadow? That's 200 lux. So 200 lux is the minimum average illumina illumination over the dex. It's 1800 lux. It's going to be 0.11, so it's very, very non-uniform. Zero being, being non-uniform, one being perfectly uniform. We want to get one, but we, but we will accept anything 70 or above. How about this desk here? Well, the average illumination for the desk, that's my workspace, is going to be 250 lux. The minimum illumination is 190 lux. 190 over 250, 75%, 76%. That's pretty good. That's a, so illumination for this desk, desk is actually quite good. So this is fine. So next is going to be uniformity of luminance. This is so to do this, you need to put yourself into the um, the shoe of your uh, of your client literally. So you might visit the office, sit at the desk with your photometer for measuring luminance, and start measuring luminance. The ideal scenario is going to be a, to be for, uh, from the perspective of your client, everything looks like it's the same brightness. The paper on the table, um, the, uh, uh, the paper on the, uh, the table, the screen that's been turned on, 
um, the general surrounding all have the same brightness. Uh, if you have a brightness of, uh, if the brightness of the task is is is, is equal to the um, to the immediate surround, let's say the desk in general, or immediately next to the screen, and just the general environment, then the the, the luminance ratio is one one one, which is the ideal scenario. But again, we don't live in an ideal world. So what we do is we allow a ratio of ten for the task. If the brightness of your task, let's say your computer screen, is a ten. The immediate surround should be, should be three or more. So let's say the area next to your next and around your screen, and the immediate surround. Let's say the the, the brightest thing in your general surround is a one or higher, but it's going to be acceptable. Is is basically what it's saying. So so so, uh, so let's work on an example here. So so here uh, the so here um. So here we are looking at a desk, uh, laptop in front of a window. This, so the brightness of the laptop screen is 104 candles per meter squared. And how about the next one, immediate surround? Just think about uh, the brightest thing surrounding your screen and your keyboard. In this case, it's going to be the surface of the table, the reflection of the table. And that's 127 candles per meter squared. And what's the brightest thing in the general surround? Uh, how do you define general surround? That's a good question. It depends upon your task. I guess it depends upon if you're working on a small screen in front of you, or if you have a, you know, if you're surrounded by big screen, then your the general surround becomes bigger as well. So, but it depends. So that's so you kind of have to use your professional judgment there. But for you know, for a case studies like this, it's just whatever is the brightest in your photo in this case. What's the brightest thing in this photo? It's going to be the window, 3,600 candles per meter squared. So that's 104.127.3623. But we want to create to change that to a ratio with the lowest number number being one. So we change that to a ratio, which is one 1.235. It's not between 111 and 10.31. So this is not a good luminance. So there we go. So um, all right. So. So, so in cases like John Smith, you might need to visit his um, offer the home visit and check how what his illumination is like. You can do these kind of tests, and then the next step would be to advise to give him advice. How could he modify his sunroom, his home office, to improve the lighting condition? Because that's the thing that's causing his eye strain. How could he modify that? I guess for night time, the first thing you're going to do is put in more modern lighting. That's the thing. But how about during the daytime? Well, what are some of the things you could do? Uh, uh, yes, and also for the artificial light. Where do you put it? How much of it does it need? Does it have to think about color, much colors? Lots of consideration goes into it. So, so you need to give, offer him some solutions. The thing is, the solution is got to depend for change from person to person. You have to individualize the solution to your client. I'm expecting you to do that in this course too. So don't do a scattergun approach where you just say, these are all the, lists you, all the things you can do and just give me a, list, a generic list, which, uh, a lot of the items which doesn't apply to a certain case, particular case. Don't do that. Make it more targeted and individualized because that's what your patient and client is expecting you to do in real life. They want you to, they want you to treat them as a person. So they are looking for individualized specific um, uh, management or uh, management plan. So that's what you have to do. But some things you could consider is shooting the offending light source, maybe blinds in this case in the sunroom, install some shut up blinds, modify the lighting, maybe put in some more lighting, maybe turn off, decrease, turn on, on off, move it around. Uh, another thing you could consider is turning his workstation. Think about where you're sitting with your laptop right now. Are you facing the window? That's probably a bad idea, especially during the daytime. Well, at the, during the day, because you're gonna might get the sun shining straight into your face. It's hard to see the screen. Oh, I don't. I turn around. I face away from the screen. I face away from the window. That actually doesn't work either, because now you're gonna be getting reflection uh, from your computer screen, and that's gonna be hard to see. Best way to do it, the sun facing the window is to face. 90 degrees. That's usually the best way to do it. 
you could adjust luminance on the screen, stuff like that. Or do you have to think, um, you have to think naturally about what kind of solution the patient needs. So, uh, so we talked about uh, we talked about lighting. We talked about radiation. Uh, the, but now we get to talk about colorimetry, the model of color, the mathematical model of colors. So we finally get to talk about the, the seeing RPC at last.